Hello, uh, my name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I would like to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts broadcast on the interplay of ADHD symptoms and behavioral issues. Today's session will focus on productive, practical strategies uh, to handle outbursts, meltdowns, defiance, and strong emotions, all of which we know are only exacerbated by uh, nearly 12 months now in a pandemic. Uh, so we will learn a hierarchy of techniques that parents, uh, caregivers can use to increase positive interactions and behavior, effective discipline strategies to manage uh, problematic behavior at home, and suggestions for adapting discipline techniques uh, to the challenges of hybrid, remote, online, in-person schooling. Uh, we're very, very fortunate and thankful to welcome to uh, leading today's session, Dr. Dave Anderson. Uh, Dave Anderson, P PhD, he's a clinical psychologist and the vice president of school and community programs at the Child Mind Institute. Dr. Anderson was formerly the senior director of the Child Mind Institute's ADHD and Behavior Disorders Center, and he specializes in evaluating and treating children and adolescents with ADHD, behavior, anxiety, and mood disorders. Child Mind Institute's school-based programs directed by Dr. Anderson have provided clinical interventions as well as social emotional skill building, professional development, and workshops for more than 50,000 students, educators, and parents. Dr. Anderson frequently lectures and leads workshops on a variety of topics uh, for parents, educators, and policymakers. He received his bachelor's from Dartmouth and his doctorate in clinical psychology from Columbia University. So before I hand over the mic to Dr. Anderson, I need to just take care of a few housekeeping items quickly. Uh, those of you who tuned into the live webinar, you may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. If you are interested in the certificate of attendance option, please just keep an eye out for an email that you will receive about an hour after we wrap up. And if you are listening in replay or podcast mode, simply visit attitudemag.com, search for podcast number 346, and there you can access the slides, webinar replay, certificate of attendance option, all that good stuff. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude, we hope you'll visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe and sign up for Attitude Magazine for your family or to share with a teacher or loved one who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. So without further ado, Dr. Anderson, thank you so much for joining us today, this really important and pertinent uh, topic, and I will hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you for being here today and for any of you who might listen uh, after this. Uh, to the, the way the presentation has been introduced, I think was quite Shakespearean in that you can kind of find ways to know the ending even in the first few slides. So I'm gonna continue in that vein for a moment, which is that uh, for those of you who may be unaware, the Child Mind Institute, uh, we're an institution that has offices in New York and San Francisco, though many of us are of course working remotely uh, at the moment, in fact, 99% of us. Uh, and you know, we provide clinical care uh, via practices in both of those cities, uh, while also doing research on objective markers of mental health, as well as the use of uh, apps and technology in mental health care. And we also uh, have many public education initiatives. On that note of public education, what I will say is that for presentations like this, the object is to be able to get sort of a, a common language and a taste of what some of these interventions might look like, in particular for kids with ADHD who are struggling during the pandemic, and specifically for the parents who've been attempting to support them uh, for 11 months of some form of online hybrid or you know, perhaps in-person schooling. Um, so with, with that in mind, what I'll also say is that there is a resources slide at the end of these slides that has books outlining all of the approaches that I'm drawing from in today's presentation and trying to get practical strategies across to the audience. And similarly, there's a couple slides on our summer program and our best kind of one day parent training program. Uh, best is not an adjective to describe it, it's behavioral and emotional skills training for caregivers. Uh, but each of those programs are things that uh, you can actually participate in from a distance. Uh, and they're the reason why we, uh, 
advertise them in presentations such as this one. So to jump on into the, the topic of today's presentation, discipline strategies for ADHD and how they might be applied both practically and kind of in a, a way that helps folks during uh, circumstances like we find ourselves in right now. So I'm going to start off with just very uh, quickly in terms of throat clearing here. It's just looking at some of the ways that ADHD symptoms and behavioral issues have asserted themselves uh, with considerations for the factors that have been involved during the pandemic. So for those of you who are familiar with ADHD diagnostic criteria, I won't go through them right here, but you can find them by Googling DSM-5 ADHD diagnostic criteria. But for those of you who are familiar, you know that the symptoms fall on two axes of behaviorally described things, inattention and hyperactivity and impulsivity. And when you diagnose ADHD, you look for the presence of at least six symptoms on either of those axes. And at the same time, you look for it across contexts. You look for a history of those symptoms, them to be happening frequently. Uh, and you also look for them to be at such an intensity that they perhaps impair a child across school or home uh, or social settings. One of the things that has become difficult during the pandemic is that frequently we are evaluating kids for ADHD. Uh, who we may not feel it's safe to evaluate in person, or we may not have an opportunity, for example, to observe them in school in person, or perhaps to meet with an entire family in person. And if you look at the kind of biopsychosocial framework here that we use for diagnosis, which allows us to consider all factors that uh, are occurring in a person's life embedded within their community and any other systemic stressors, the reality of the pandemic is that there are massive systemic stressors in the sense that many communities across the country have been disproportionately hit with all manner of financial insecurity, housing insecurity, job insecurity, uh, increased family conflict, all kinds of stressors that could cause exacerbation of symptoms. And similarly, if you look at the social bubble here on the biopsychosocial model, uh, we're watching kids who are struggling to kind of keep up, especially those with ADHD, with new and different educational settings uh, that are not in, in any way uh, better or more adapted to ADHD symptoms, who are still struggling with finding social connections or being able to maintain peer relationships, who are likely struggling with any, any number of levels of family conflict as family members are pulled in all kinds of different directions. And then at the same time, as I was kind of referring to earlier, many families have felt a huge socioeconomic uh, kind of, uh, you know, consequence of the pandemic, and that has also caused an immense amount of stress. So what it means is that at least during the pandemic, we have increased reports of all manner of psychological symptoms from ADHD to anxiety to depression. And that means that even more people likely need some of the interventions we're going to talk about today, whether or not they might be diagnosed post-pandemic with these particular uh, mental health and learning disorders. So the other slide I'll use for framing is just that you know, when we look at how we used to frame ADHD for educators in in-person settings, and I, I say used to because I know we will again, but, you know, this is uh, in many ways not as relevant over the last 11 months. The reason why I throw this slide in here is that parents are now oftentimes the proctors who are observing these same uh, symptoms, but in new and sometimes even more challenging ways while attempting to support their child's functioning at home whether it's just in doing homework for the kids who are attending either limited hours or full hours school with masks on, or for kids who are still attending in person, or even for younger children whose schools may not be meeting whatsoever. But it's that what parents are seeing is that as their children are spending days, for example, on Zoom, uh, or trying to engage in digitally delivered classes, they're seeing the distractibility in the sense that we hear from many, many parents that they can leave the room for a second and the kid's no longer positioned in front of the computer, but they're somewhere else playing with something else or distracted by something else they just had to get in order to be successful. They're having trouble staying in the actual seat. And it's even harder in a non-in-person situation for a lot of kids with ADHD. They're often coming to the Zoom or to the Teams or the Google Classroom uh, unprepared. They, even though their books are only two rooms away, they may have forgotten certain materials or may not have those materials organized, or they may have forgotten the assignment from that before, or the very area where they work may be so disorganized it's hard for them to find things. Uh, we can see the restlessness as the kids are trying to focus in class, and as we often hear educators coming from the other side saying, you know, I need to see you on camera, or I need everyone to turn on their video, or I'd like everyone to participate, even as kids with ADHD are having more and more difficulty with restlessness. Uh, we may see impulsivity, and this is pronounced in different ways in online education, in that kids who are 
engaged in these online forums may forget to mute their microphone and be talking, thinking no one can hear them, or they may disrupt the class by talking over others, thinking that others are not planning to participate at that moment, uh, or they may choose to use parts of the online forum or parts of the computer they're logged in on for other tasks uh, impulsively, just because computers don't tend to throw up that many barriers to that kind of work. And finally, you have the work habits, which is just that you know the same things that a teacher might have had a bit more environmental control over in school, parents are finding are that much more difficult at home because there's less lessening level of environmental control. And also parents often have uh, more jobs than just facilitating the educational environment. And that means that work habits can be really difficult to either teach, uh, reinforce, or prompt. So with that, I want to take a look, before we jump into practical strategies, at the ways we intervene for ADHD. And what I'm going to try to focus in on for about 30 minutes here, which is that when we look at ADHD, the intervention for ADHD, it's that... Uh, we look at three different audiences of intervention, and this is where ADHD intervention, at least when it's evidence-based, is different from other types of treatment for children and adolescents. It's that when you look at the gold standard in terms of intervention, parents, especially for kids, say, younger than teenage years, are the absolute first line of defense. And we often say that it's not so much that parents are at fault for the difficulties that kids with ADHD may have with behavior or attention or their own emotion dysregulation in situations where it is hard to pay attention or that they find boring or non-novel. It's just the parents are the solution. And so in that sense, what interventions show, for those of you who've seen other talks by folks like Russell Barkley, who may have uh, done a number of seminars this year for Attitude uh, and, and many other interventionists, it's that Russell Barkley has a, a particular phrase he uses, which is point of performance and also externalizing feedback at the point of performance. It's that if you want someone with ADHD to function well, you need to be coaching the person who's coaching them. It's not about being in an office with that particular person saying, you know, what do you think about this strategy? And then sending them back out in the world. And I can tell you from my experience in my clinical career, it's not just the research that shows this. Anecdotally, if I've got a particular patient that I'm well bonded with, they're going to really be you know, genuine and believe in themselves in my office. They're going to say, look, I'm going to leave the office. I'm going to do this strategy. I'm going to focus on organizing my school materials, or I'm going to focus in class, or I'm going to participate more appropriately, or I'm going to keep you know, my fidgeting during circle time to a minimum, whatever it might be. But the fact is that when they leave the office, that generalization fades away. And it's not necessarily their fault. It's that we're, we're focused in a certain way with intervention, especially for young brains, on helping to bring their attention to the salient details of their environment that we need them to pay attention to, rather than the details they're going to be naturally driven to pay attention to. And that's where finding a supportive way to do that by training educators and parents on strategies that support and stay kind of one step behind a kid in helping them to manage their attention is absolutely key both to relationship building and to high functioning. Now, while we do that, we try to make sure that parents are caring for themselves, managing their own stress. As kids get older, into the teenage years, we are able to start teaching some collaborative problem-solving techniques that have an evidence base behind them, where we can bring teens more into the discussion for the interventions that we're delivering and say, okay, here's the problem we're facing. What solutions might you have? Propose a few solutions, and then try to agree on some sort of compromise to try and really follow up with over the course of a two-week period. In school, we really focus on doing observations of the kind of impact that ADHD symptoms are having on a kid, even if it's you know digital schooling. Uh, we try to look at what resources are already existing in the school, uh, whether it's an IEP or a 504 plan or uh, what's been shown through an outside assessment to be really useful for the kid's functioning. And then we, we try to make sure that we help educators uh, to be able to have the strategies to help manage ADHD symptoms. And particularly when kids start to get into late elementary school ages and beyond, we can begin teaching them organizational skills for which they can take on a larger measure of responsibility. And for those of you who may ask a question at the end about why we start that in late elementary school, that's where the evidence indicates kids are first able to have the kind of prefrontal functioning to be able to take responsibility for the organizational skills. Before that, we have to do it for them. We are their frontal lobe. And then finally, when we look at, at interventions for ADHD, we're looking at the things that work individually for kids, which are medication, which remains a frontline intervention for ADHD. For those of you who wonder, I have no disclosures to make. Our organization does not take money from pharmaceutical companies, and I have never been paid by a pharmaceutical company. 
So when I say medication, I'm basing that on the evidence that shows that stimulant medication is helpful in the treatment of ADHD significantly. What I'll also say is that again, as kids get older, uh, we can teach organizational skills beginning at fifth grade and beyond oftentimes. Uh, for kids with ADHD who experience social skills deficits, we can engage in social skills training. But what the evidence shows is that if you don't teach parents, educators, babysitters, and other caregivers the skills to generalize uh, social skills that may be taught in a social skills group, uh, you don't see generalization. In other words, if you don't behaviorally train the caregivers who are at the point of performance, kids learning skills in a social skills group may only practice those skills in the group. They may not generalize it to friendships or classrooms or their sports team. Uh, and lastly, as kids get older, there's mixed evidence on the effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for ADHD symptoms. And look, that's coming from a couple different uh, sources in the sense that uh, if you do cognitive behavioral therapy, it needs to really target ADHD-related impairment, which a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy may be uh, a little bit less closely related to ADHD symptoms. Last thing I'll say about intervention is that one thing you do not see here is play therapy. Now, importantly, play therapy for younger children can be fantastic in finding a supportive relationship, a place to process emotions, and there are play-based aspects, for example, of uh, many trauma, anxiety, and mood disorder evidence-based treatments. That said, the play-based aspects that you see in treatment for ADHD tend to be training parents and educators in play situations to demonstrate certain behavioral skills in their interaction with a kid so that when they get into non-play situations, they can really demonstrate those skills because that's where it gets a lot harder. But to be sure, there is no evidence that play therapy interventions individually with a child work to decrease impairment due to ADHD. So now launching into just some very practical things that I'll discuss over the next few minutes. When we talk about the foundations of psychosocial intervention at home, what it looks like for supporting kids with ADHD pre-pandemic and then with a few considerations for the pandemic, here are the basics that we run through. Every intervention that we do with parents, whether it's a young child or a teenager, starts with figuring out how to build rapport and relationship. Because the fact is that in order to give feedback to any human, there has to be some appreciation for the time you spend together that doesn't seem to be contingent on anything, for the fact that you appreciate each other, for the fact that you connect on certain things. Relationships are the bedrock from which effective behavioral change happens. And you can, uh, I should say, affect behavioral change with the strategies outlined after these slides, uh, you know, even without a close relationship with someone. But if you focus on building the relationship first, uh, the evidence already shows that just that component of many treatments that, in, that uh, are focused on behavioral intervention uh, with kids with ADHD can be uh, really effective. So the purpose of relationship building is this. This is Patterson's coercive cycle. So when we look at the kinds of cycles that parents are often caught in with kids with ADHD and behavioral difficulties, uh, this is something that should be very familiar to people. It's that for one reason or another, a parent tries to set a boundary or say no. For one reason or another, the child perhaps doesn't hear it, doesn't follow through on it, refuses outright, act actually decides to consciously ignore it, any number of reactions by the child. And we start to see this kind of escalation. That's what the course of cycle is. It's that at that point, the parent, through no fault of their own, it's just kind of human nature, uh, gets irritable and starts yelling uh, and thinks that I'm going to assert my authority through getting louder and getting bigger and uh, showing some emotional uh, power that maybe helps the child to realize how much this is meaningful. Uh, the child often escalates uh, either through escaping the situation, uh, you know, acting as if they just don't care, or even refusing with more emotional dysregulation. And you keep kind of going in that cycle. Now, the, the key about the coercive cycle is that at some point, somebody gives in or somebody gives up or somebody leaves the situation or somebody escapes. And this maintains the coercive cycle. If a child gets to leave the situation without doing the thing, maintains the coercive cycle because they eventually escaped. If the parent's escalation causes the child to eventually do the thing all or in part, that escalation is further reinforced because the parent thinks, what choice do I have than to escalate when I need something done? Because after all, what else was I supposed to do in that situation? The answer is, we hope to give you some ideas today. And similarly, if the child gets dysregulated and the parent says, okay, I just can't handle this, nothing's going to happen, and they leave, again, the course of cycle gets reinforced. 
So the first step in any intervention from childhood through teenage years with kids who experience ADHD symptoms or behavioral symptoms is to pull people out of the course of cycle and to focus on creating moments in a Marie Kondo-esque way of joy. Now, if you can't muster joy because it's just too irritating or you know you spend so much time together during the pandemic that it's just an impossibility for you, it's not so much that we want you to fake joy. It's merely that we want you to put yourself in a situation where you're most likely to actually experience some enjoyment at some point in the distant future. It's not that you have to enjoy it right away. But the idea is you know, make it so that you set the situation up for success. So we're trying to establish a bit warmer relationship with a child or teen as money in the bank, because if someone feels appreciated, if someone feels like you spend time with them that isn't contingent on following your directions or doing what you say, there's a sense that, okay, this person is both here for me and may have a reason why they have to assert their authorities and authority in other places. And what this gets us toward is a balance between structure and nurture that is at the heart of being an effective behavior manager. It's having this baseline of nurturance and wanting to support someone and highlight their successes so that when you do have to give them feedback, it's coming from a place of empathy, you know, mutually shared affection and appreciation for their efforts. Because the, the fact is, and this is something that we emphasize a lot in presentations, when a kid is anxious, it often breeds some empathy for us. We want to help them be less scared. We want to help them to emerge and kind of uh, be able to confront the world. When a kid's feeling depressed, we think to ourselves, you know, I don't want them to be sad. I want to help them to feel like, you know, there's things that could bring them joy again. But when kids come to us with ADHD symptoms, uh, even for the most validating, empathic, and understanding parents and educators, often the thought is they're just not trying hard enough, or they just don't want to, or why can't they understand this, or we've had this conversation a thousand times, or God, I'm so irritated, I just can't do this again. And that's where behavior, in its kind of repetitive uh, way that it makes you feel like you're in, in ruts, inspires nowhere near the same level of empathy. But it needs that same level of empathy in order to facilitate some level of change. So we try to think about across uh, you know, teenagers and children is to figure out how we can get people to start spending quality time. Now, importantly, we do this in couples therapy. We do this when we coach bosses with their employees and workplace environments. It's that if you want to form a relationship with someone, pick an activity that you think has a chance that people are going to enjoy themselves. You're present in the experience. You're not distracted by emails. Uh, you're not doing something else. Uh, you're not looking at your phone. Uh, you're not talking about how you have to sweep the floor at the same time or clean off the table with paper towel, even as they're building with Legos on the floor. It's that you're trying to be as present as you possibly can in their experience, even if you're bored, or even if the thing that they enjoy is particularly boring to you, which often happens with little kids. And then also parents will say that watching a teenager play video games or uh, do something else is quite boring for them. And our answer is, you know, unify with them in what matters in their world. Your job is to follow their lead. Just let them lead you through the experience, whatever they're building, whatever they're doing, whatever they're talking about, whatever they're interested in. What you focus on in quality time is giving attention to positive behaviors. Now, this can take many forms. Oh, my gosh, that's amazing how you put all those blocks on top of each other. You built such an incredibly tall tower. That can be giving, you know, positive attention to a little kid. But at the same time, you know, just with an older kid, it can be, hey, you know, thanks so much for sharing that with me. Like, it was really interesting to hear your thoughts on that. It's an attention to positive behavior. Or, oh, my gosh, you're telling me you picked up that care package so quickly while I was watching you play Call of Duty. And clearly, you and your team are working together really well to complete this mission. Again, attention to positive behaviors, even if we don't think the activity itself has great merit or value. Then the other thing you think about in trying to build a relationship with anyone, you decrease the number of directions you're giving them. You decrease the number of reminders you're giving them about things that are coming next that they're going to have to do. You try to decrease the number of questions. The only reason why you decrease the number of questions, lots of people think that's a way of getting to know somebody. You have to really listen to the answers to questions. If you just ask a ton of questions, people feel like they're just trying to like kind of meet you where you're at in a sort of ping pong fashion. And they're just jumping from like kind of question to question. Similarly, for parents who may have strained relationships with their kids or teens, Questions often seem to imply judgment, even when there's not any, in the sense that, you know, a parent can walk into a teen's room and in a totally neutral voice say, what are you doing? And a teenager, even if the parent finds the most innocuous vocal tone, will hear that as you disapprove and, you know, they'll get defensive. So it's why we say, OK, if we can avoid directions, reminding them, hey, listen, you got 15 more minutes on this and then you got to go to dinner that kind of stuff. Not saying you don't give reminders, just that when you're spending quality time, try to take them down. 
And then critical statements. You know, I can't believe you spend your time on this. Like, this is what Call of Duty is. This is what Fortnite is. You know, this is, is ridiculous, especially since I saw your French grade. So again, critical statements are not helpful in, you know, increasing the, the kind of quality of quality time. And the last thing is we, we search for uh, overlapping rituals. Uh, I can't tell you how many kids uh, I will kind of search out and figure out, like, do they like baseball? Are they really interested in a particular thing that they collect? Uh, is this something where they're into a particular show or a cartoon character? The more I can learn even at just a basic level about something that interests them, the more they can see that I'm trying to meet them on a, a playing field that is theirs. So then the next thing is, if you're going to effectively intervene with behavior, you've started off, you understand some of the interventions that may work and the fact you want to get yourself out of the course of cycle. The next thing is you're trying to fortify your relationship by spending at least two or three instances in any given week where you're really focusing on spending quality time with, say, an older kid. Or if it's a younger kid, you're trying to spend five minutes a day with those quality time rules that I outlined. Now then, if you want to change behavior, your first step is data collection. Now, there's a real reason why we ask people to collect very specific data on behavior. And it's not because we're nerds, even though we completely are. It's that when you're trying to change behavior, you have to look at what most of the data show you, not what the, emo the most emotionally valenced data are showing you. So frequently for us as clinicians, if someone comes in and they're having difficulty with a child's behavior, they'll tell us about the two or three worst moments of the week. The moments where it's like, what should I have done, clinician, to make it so this never happens again? And our answer is that behavioral change happens through hundreds and hundreds of trials over time. It's not about what you do in a one-time only moment. It's about what you do in each instance where you have a chance to practice certain strategies. So in that sense, in order to know if an intervention is working, it often isn't do the big moments decrease, which that may happen over the course of 12 to 20 weeks of treatment. That absolutely happens in the sense that we see less amplitude or intensity in those big moments. But we don't want to judge behavior change on that. We want to judge behavior change on how much someone's doing little things. So I'll often go back to sports metaphors and this kind of stuff. You know, I, I thought my best soccer coaches were the ones who could give me feedback on my process throughout an entire game and all the little things I was doing than just whether or not I scored goals. I played defense in soccer. I hardly ever scored a goal. If that was the only thing I was judged on, uh, it would have been impossible to demonstrate you know, improvement the way I wanted to. But given the fact that my coaches were focused on so many different skills I was gaining, I could get feedback in a number of different areas. And that's how we judge about whether or not behavior is improving. It's that at baseline, we say to people, what are the specific behaviors that you can observe either multiple times a day or when they occur in any given week? When do they happen? Where do they happen? With whom do they happen? And now that we've done a little bit of a tracking of what it is you're looking at at the beginning of an intervention, what we can do is then take data at various points as we apply these strategies to be able to say, okay, here's you know, how this behavior is improving. So for example, somebody might say, there are moments when my kid loses it and locks themselves in a bathroom. And we would say, okay, we get that. The locking themselves in the bathroom may be you know, once a week, but at the same time, getting dysregulated and really getting rageful or yelling things might happen four times a day. That's what we want to hone in on is the thing that's happening a little bit more frequently where we can say, okay, how can we reinforce the moments where the kid deals with stress well? How can we try to give them an opportunity to bounce back when they're starting to escalate? How can we give them an opportunity to, to kind of track these moments of high amplitude and thereby kind of decrease all of the different emotional reactivity that could happen throughout the day, not just judging our success based on how many bathroom doors get locked in any given week. The last thing I'll say about behavior tracking is that frequently what we also try to understand with parents because it relates to the behavior interventions we engage in is what motivates a behavior. What's its function? Is it that the kid is looking for some sort of emotional internal experience or sensory stimulation? Are they looking to escape something they don't like or want to avoid? Are they looking to get a certain kind of attention, whether bad or good, from their sibling, their peer, or their parent? And are they looking for some sort of tangible privilege or reinforcement? All of these things motivate all of us. It's not always just one of these things. It can be a landscape of them. For example, in the course of cycle, you know, if you ask a kid to do their homework, uh, you know, they, they might feel that they want to both escape something and also get the tangible reinforcer of trying to get you to give up so they can spend a little more time on the iPad. But they also still may be reinforced by getting some attention from their siblings as they have an argument with you about doing the homework. We want to change that whole landscape make it so the emotional state they're seeking, the sensory stimulation they're seeking is aligned with the goal we have for them. 
that we prevent the escape as much as we can, that we give them attention for the behavior we would like to see, not the behavior that we don't. And finally, that we link the tangible privileges and reinforcers that they care about to the behaviors that we would like to see amplified. So now you think about it, you're looking at training the adults in a child or teen's environment at the point of performance. You're first building relationships as part of the intervention. Then you're getting some good data at baseline on what behaviors you're trying to change so you can really judge whether or not your interventions work. And then you get to the behavioral hierarchy, which is that what we teach parents, and again, these approaches are outlined in much more detail in the books that I've included on the resource slide at the end here and in the programs that I've uh, included links to uh, at the end here. Um, but these, these techniques, they cut across uh, every major uh, model of behavioral parent training. It's that we teach parents how to set the stage for success in certain ways, how to attend to certain positive behaviors and to bolster that skill as something you use most often, how to withdraw attention from minor misbehavior, how to give good directions for kids who really need intensive intervention, how to create a good behavior plan, and then finally, how to give good consequences for uh, the most severe behaviors, the most severe misbehavior. And what you build is this pyramid where you spend most of your time whenever, and I, I go back to my example of parents who come in and give us the two to three worst moments of the week. The object is not to take the two to three worst moments of the week and say, here's what you should have done in that moment to punish your kid to make it never happen again. It's that as you can see, the punishment for misbehavior is supposed to be used most sparingly and only in those most severe moments. It's that we build out the system for what you do the rest of the week. How do we set the stage to make it so this behavior is less likely to be elicited the rest of the week? How do we positively attend or, or give positive feedback to the behavior that is the opposite of the one that caused the, the, you know, uh, the moment where you wanted to really punish the kid? The sense that if it's them locking themselves in the bathroom, how do we actually give attention or reward the behavior that involves calmly? dealing with stressors, or even, you know, just a lower level of escalation around those stressors before being able to bounce back? How do we actively ignore things that, you know, if we were to give attention may only exacerbate the response to a stressor? How do we give good directions when the kid is starting to lose it? If the kid is really having difficulty, how do we structure a chart or a behavior plan or a contract that allows them to really explicitly know that this is our focus and see an explicit tying of that to some of the privileges you have in existence uh, at home. And then finally, how do we punish it dispassionately when something does occur? So to give you a sense of how we set the stage, uh, this is drawn, for example, and my, my citation is uh, just kind of covered over by the Attitude logo here, but it's drawn from Linda Fifner's 2011 book, which is also in my resources slide. But it's that when we talk about setting the stage for success, especially with ADHD, how can we make things structured, create clear rules and routines ahead of time? How can we make it salient? So in that sense, I talk frequently with kids with ADHD about uh, you know, scenery blindness in the sense that you need things to be salient and fresh in order to remind you to do certain things creatively. It needs to not be a post-it note that gathers dust on your mirror for two years, reminding you to do a particular thing. It's that if you make a list of stuff or you include visual reminders for yourself, change it up frequently so that it becomes novel and you can kind of make little jokes to yourself or have little jokes with family members or partners or whomever else is reminding you uh, in order to make it so that this is uh, salient to you and fresh. Uh, it's consistency, which I'll talk about for each of the strategies here. Uh, it's thinking about motivation. Again, it's thinking about that kind of acronym, SEAT, sensory, escape, attention, and tangible, which relates to the function of any given behavior and how we can kind of change that landscape to motivate a kid toward the behaviors that we're looking for or help a teen motivate themselves toward the behaviors we're looking for. And then finally, it's figuring out how we can be flexible in capturing interest since so much of the core uh, deficit of ADHD is paying attention to or following through with things that you find uninteresting or boring. So to illustrate that a little bit, I'll, I'll show an example of structure and salience here, which is that during the pandemic, for example, we, we often have created you know, morning routine sheets. Even for uh, older kids, we've done this, but the pictures tend to be a little bit less kidified. But you know, we create visual cues for young kids that show them what they need to do because they may not necessarily be reading yet, what order they need to do it in. And sometimes we give them you know, estimated time for those things since time estimates have been shown to be one of the deficits that a lot of kids with ADHD suffer from. So they'll say, 
when I say about that time deficit, what the research has shown is that kids with ADHD will often overestimate the amount of time it takes to do something they hate, and they'll underestimate the amount of time it takes to do something they love. And so we try to make sure that we give accurate time estimates for any particular thing in order to help with that particular issue. So this is an example of structure and salience for routines. Another example of structure and salience for routines in remote learning is right here, where we're trying to show someone, here are the behaviors your teacher is looking for. And we can kind of paste this right next to the computer to say, take a look at this anytime you want to kind of remind yourself of what your participation is supposed to be structured around. And similarly, it reminds parents, here's what you can reinforce when you're standing near your kid. Now, for those of you who may have heard this point a lot, to return to the hierarchy, you know, we have the setting the stage for success piece. Then we have the strategies that we utilize for paying attention to positive behaviors with very specific positive feedback. So this is very much outlined in Alan Kasdan's books, uh, which one of them, the Everyday Parenting Toolkit, is in my resources slides. Um, but what we think about with you know, giving positive feedback is we try to make it so that parents are giving very specific positive feedback for the behavior they'd like to see. So instead of good job or great or excellent or high five, you're saying what it is they did. Great job finishing your work. Great job using a calm voice. It was really wonderful how you raised your hand during your online class just now. You're specific. You're consistent in the sense you're trying to catch them being good when they demonstrate the behaviors that mean the most for you. We, we quest for sincerity. It can be tough when someone's first engaging these skills. And oftentimes, a couple weeks in, parents will object to the skills and say, look, this just isn't me. It doesn't feel genuine. Do you have something else? And our answer is, if you can push through that, you will find this becomes more a sincere part of your toolbox. Nobody feels natural you know, the first time they swing a golf club. Keep swinging. So we try to get it to be sincere. We try to get it to be as close to behavior as possible so that people can really make that connection in their brains that this behavior leads to this outcome of positive attention, especially with younger kids who want to be physically close. Uh, we can use nonverbal reinforcers in the sense that we can give a thumbs up or a high five, but we only want to do that in situations where it's really clear what we're giving a thumbs up or a high five for so that that behavior can occur again in future situations. The thing that we also focus on with positive uh, praise is that Frequently in situations where there's low demand or where you can play with a kid or a team, we tell parents, try to get three times as many comments about things you like as you've gotten, as you've got comments about things that you need to provide corrective feedback around. The reason for that is a principle called overlearning. It's that if in the least challenging situations, you seek out a three to one ratio of positive to negative feedback, uh, when you get into the challenging situations, you might have a prayer of being able to give positive feedback for effort that is made or for follow through to a certain degree before perhaps losing our cool around something that we really feel the child is capable of. To give an example of just some positive praises that we often use uh, at the moment in academic coaching, especially for those parents who are, uh, you know, basically acting the role of perhaps, uh, you know, being divided between their own work and being a homeschooling teacher. These are just a few examples of some of the very specific feedback you can give and for which you can kind of search for your own genuineness in saying to a kid, you're so focused on this. You read these directions really carefully. All of these you know, behaviors and the, these particular uh, pieces of feedback are also focused around things we know kids with ADHD often have a lot of difficulty with. And that's the exercise we usually lead parents through is we say, look, take the thing that the kid has the most difficulty with and you know, try to think what's its positive opposite and then try to reinforce that as much as you can verbally. And this particular kind of uh, skill itself was taken from another model of behavioral parent training called The Incredible Years uh, by Carolyn Webster Stratton. So, you know, if you think about the pyramid that we're building, it's that we have, you know, evidence-based intervention with the adults in a child's environment. You're trying to build your relationship first. Then you're trying to think about, okay, how can I collect good data on the behaviors I'm looking for? Then you think about, okay, how can I set the stage and make my routines clear and give visually salient cues for what we're trying to do when the iron is cold and not when we're all mad about it? How can I better pay positive attention to the behaviors I'd like to see? And then similarly, for the behaviors that are dependent on my attention to survive, calling out in class, whining, arguing, attitude, interrupting, all of these behaviors are to some degree dependent on our attention to survive. Now, granted, they also may give a teenager a sense of control and power and that kind of stuff, which is an internal sensory experience that can also keep them reinforced. Again, the landscape is multifaceted. But frequently, if we can just withdraw our attention from that behavior and not necessarily explicitly address it, 
while paying attention to other behaviors that a child or teen might be engaged in, uh, we can see some success at seeing that behavior decrease because it no longer serves a function. It won't get a teen or a child what they're looking for. And again, I can go into more detail on that strategy during the question, but I'm just going to hit uh, behavior plans real quick and consequences, and then we can all uh, you know, start asking questions about specifics. But to, to go to the way that we start to get into more uh, structured behavioral strategies, uh, if you think about the fact that you're, you're trying to begin with as many positive behavior strategies as you can, in the sense that we often teach these strategies in a sequence that build on each other to the point where you often see a decrease in disruptive or difficult behaviors with each strategy that's introduced, the next strategy we think about is how do you give effective instruction? And it's that if you're going to tell someone to do something, use your instructions sparingly about only the things that really matter to you. Keep your cool when you're giving it. Be clear and straightforward. So don't ask it as a question and say, can you take out your textbook? Or, hey, can you pick up the sock? Or later, can you help me with the dishes? It's, you know, you get to the point of performance and you say, please help me with the dishes. Um, it's harder to remember a series of instructions. So giving them one at a time allows you the opportunity to reinforce for follow through on each one. And it also breaks it down for kids with ADHD who may have difficulty with oral working memory. If you're not writing it down, it can be very difficult to remember. And you want to wait for follow through in the sense that if you can catch it and say, you know, even catch some approximation of follow through, you increase the chance that someone's going to follow your directions in the future. That wait for follow through point is one that is the most frequent focus of coaching for us. It's that parents tend to think because they're parents, and because they have a certain level of authority, kids should just want to follow through on the commands. And the, the difficulty is often uh, kids do not necessarily just want to follow through on the commands, but they do a bit more if they feel like they're at least getting credit for what they were doing. Even if, as many parents say to us, the bar was low, or it's just something they're supposed to do, or I never got credit when I was a kid, any of those things. People respond better when they feel like they're giving credit, whether it's your partner for putting a dish in the sink or your teenager. One of the last points that I'll go into before we move to questions is just this. Putting some of the strategies together uh, into a particular kind of overarching, like kind of, you know, gestalt strategy takes time. And these interventions really build on each other. So just to tie together a few strategies that we use with parents, when you're trying to get kids to be persistent in a particular task, one of the things that you can do is you can tie together uh, things that we, we think about as the, the roots of persistence coaching. It's that if you're working with a kid, for example, on a homework assignment that they are having difficulty with and don't really believe in themselves around, one of the things that you can do is you can say, okay, I'm going to praise something they just did you know, recently or in the past. I'm going to make a positive prediction about what's going on. I'm going to prompt the next small task that I think they can you know, get a W on uh, in, this ta in this particular sequence, and I'm going to have patience. And then I'm just going to keep practicing that strategy over and over. So we will coach parents to sit next to a kid, even as they throw vitriol and attitude and all kinds of negative self-statements and criticism of the parent. And just say, you know, last night, you got through your math homework in less than 20 minutes. And I, I really thought it was incredible how you got through the first four, four problems by applying that strategy really well over and over. You know, I think you're going to be able to do the same thing tonight. Let's just start with problems one and two. And it's continuing to apply that strategy over and over, even in the face of a lot of the stuff that a child will throw at you, which we call an extinction burst, which is where they're trying to push you back into a rut of losing your cool or getting angry or telling them that you just can't do this so that they can kind of escape that homework assignment in that moment. So last thing I'll go to before questions, it's just that if people have questions about charting, uh, I'll go back to that just because sometimes that's too much of a deep dive for a quick talk like this, but I can always go back to those slides. But just in terms of consequences for misbehavior, the other piece that we build in for parents, it's that the reason why we want to make sure in any presentation to emphasize consequences for misbehavior is this. Harsh punishments, which we're all drawn toward because we think that they're going to uh, really make someone think about what they've done or that their emotional dysregulation in relation to the harsh punishment will somehow change their behavior. Uh, all of that is fallacy. Harsh punishments have only short-term success. We don't, false, we don't fault parents for the fact that they want to use harsh punishments because we understand that you might be very angry and you might be saying, I want to take away the iPad for the rest of time, or I want to take away that you know, thing or privilege they've been looking forward to forever, that kind of stuff, or I want to yell at them for a while. And we'll say, like, we get where that impulse comes from, but know that it may not have the intended effect. Punishments, what they do is they delineate that a negative behavior has occurred 
but they don't teach any more positive behavior. The best example I can give you is one of my patients right now. He wrote something on social media that his parents disapproved of, you know, as a teenager. Uh, and it was, it was about criticism about his family. Taking away his social media will not teach him how to be a better citizen on social media. It will definitely cause him to think about perhaps what he's done if it's taken away for perhaps an appropriate amount of time. But at the same time, we still need to teach what appropriate behavior on social media looks like. Because what often happens with teenagers is you take away all their social media, and then all of a sudden, you know, they appear very appropriate for a brief period of time after the social media is restored, but they haven't really learned anything. They're just engaging kind of fear-based conditioning where it's like, okay, I'm afraid again, it's taken away again, so I just won't say anything offensive. And then when the parents stop paying attention, they may go back to the same old ways. So what we need to disabuse ourselves of is the notion that harsh punishment works, that an emotional reaction from a child or a teen means it's working, uh, because what it really does is deteriorate the quality of parent-child interaction and not necessarily teach anything. The way you teach things is by going back to the parts of the pyramid that should be used with higher frequency, which is to set the stage for success, create reminders of the behaviors you've set out, ground rules and expectations around, catch a kid being good, withdraw attention for their minor mishaps, and give effective directions in situations where you really believe that behavior needs to be. So when you think about your consequence of misbehavior, it's that you really want to think about it in advance. What are you going to take away so that in the moment, your passion doesn't cause you to take away the iPad for the rest of time? You want to administer in a neutral or calm voice. The reason why a neutral or calm voice works for administering a consequence is that if you train a kid to think that they need to wait until you yell before they give a consequence, they will undoubtedly wait until you yell before you see any sort of compliance. The more you deliver consequences in a neutral or calm voice, you teach kids not to wait for you to yell. You teach them to understand that when it, you really mean business, they're not going to see other signs. So there's a reason to listen. You want to use sparingly because as we've discussed, you know, if you're coming from a place of nurturance and a positive relationship, people often listen better. And that's why the stuff earlier in the pyramid is more useful. You want to administer immediately after behavior occurs. This is true of almost any consequence, whether it's positive reinforcement for a behavior you like or a consequence for misbehavior. You want to give it in small doses. And the reason why we say this is that we want parents to assess whether or not the punishment or the medicine is doing its work. Because if you administer a punishment, you should see a decrease in certain behaviors. And if you don't, then we go back to the drawing board and figure out what might not be working about the punishment. The last thing I'll say about punishment is this. You got to reset after you deliver the consequence. I have two children under five. Uh, you know, when uh, I, I give a consequence to my eldest, uh, who's nearing five years old right now, whether that be the removal of a privileged activity or some of the time he'd like to watch Peppa Pig or any number of things, uh, you know, frequently it may be a little while until I can serve the consequence and he doesn't deserve to be in purgatory necessarily for the rest of that time. It's that if I see him doing something positively or if he bounces back or if he's nice to his sister or if he speaks in a calm voice, I want to catch that, even if it won't save him from losing the 10 minutes of Peppa Pig later on. So anyway, I'll pause there and we can start with questions. Let's go for it. Wonderful. Thank you so yes. much, Dr. Anderson. Um, I will do my best to get through. We have a lot of questions, so I'll sure. do my best to hit these. You can see I talk fast, so I'll try to hit as many as I there can. There we go. Yeah. Biggest pain point, um, yeah. technology. Yeah. A lot of questions about um, two sides of it, but uh, sort of um, video games yeah. and transitions away from video games. Yeah. So all of that positive reinforcement, then what do you do when, um, when they w simply won't get off the game and, yeah. or are sneaking the games when they should be in uh, remote school? Right. So, uh, first thing is we talk to parents. Okay. Let's talk about setting the stage, get control over your environment as much as we can. Now, granted, there's been a huge proliferation of gaming devices or possible avenues to games, even over the last decade, which has made this problem so much harder for modern parents. What we say is, let's get parental controls on computers, on iPads, on uh, phones, if that's what's needed at first. Because what we may frame to the child or teen is that we will relax these controls as we see them trying to manage their impulses more consciously. And then similarly, uh, you know, when we look at these types of things, we say to parents, you know, as much as you can get the devices charging near to you where you can monitor them, get the video game controllers for various systems and make it so they have to be checked out like it's a library. And for any kids, you know, computer that they might have for school, 
oftentimes we're trying to do is help parents to think about how they can use either already built in options on stuff like Macs around like the settings around screen time uh, or programs that you can download that will allow you to set, for example, uh, off, like there, there will be periods during the day where you can say these apps or these particular things or these websites are not allowed to be accessed. And that can decrease a lot of that impulsivity and distractibility. So if you can get control environmentally over whether or not you are bestowing video games or giving that sort of break time, because lots of kids, you know, they, they, that's, that's their, their time to relax and kind of blow off steam. We still want to give them that opportunity, whether it's contingent or non-contingent. And then the other thing I think parents brought up there is that if you're seeing that you've given, for example, video games or online activities as a reward, but then you're getting a lot of vitriol and attitude and screaming and you know, running away or uh, stuff like that when they come off of it. What we'll often say to parents is many modern parents don't understand that games today are you know, so interwoven and linked to friendships that like, it can be hard for a kid to stop the game in that exact moment. They may be abandoning their friends in the midst of a quest or something they were doing. So it's often good to give kind of a soft barrier for the stop that you talk with a kid ahead of time is reasonable. But then beyond that, if you see a lot of emotional dysregulation or a lot of defiance in coming off of these devices, that can be one of the main things that affects your next trial. So in the sense that the kid may be earning those things for good behavior, for finishing their homework, but also some of that time may be dependent on how calm they stayed when they came off to the devices the previous time. And we find a lot of success with linking those two. Next question. Great. The next pain point you just yeah. mentioned, uh, emotional dysregulation. And we've yeah. got questions kind of in two categories. So yeah. younger kids, a lot yeah. of hitting outbursts, like physical yeah. violence. And then yeah. for older children, it's like the snarky sort of oppositional defiance, yeah. you know, get out of my room. I hate you type uh, emotional right. dysregulation. So frequently within behavioral parent training interviews, uh, hitting or things that endanger another person's safety uh, are the first focus for us of house rules. So what we'll say is there are many things that you can shape with positive behavioral strategies in the sense that we want a strategy that's multi-tiered, where when a kid comes up against a stressor or comes up against a situation that would cause high emotionality, whether they're young or old, we really want to give positive feedback as genuinely as we can for dealing with it calmly or being flexible or, you know, uh, even if it's something where the, the kid gets exasperated, but it isn't directed at a family member, uh, you know, expressing emotion versus, you know, insulting somebody, these can be reinforced as ways of better dealing with frustrations. And that relates to kind of the multi-tiered model where you're both praising the positive opposite while also giving consequences for the more severe behavior. But frequently within uh, behavioral parent uh, models, what we're thinking about for hitting or pushing or being in someone else's space is that that should be linked to a very clear, predictable consequence. A lot of times for three to seven-year-old kids, we're linking that to a brief timeout of about three minutes in duration uh, through certain interventions. Uh, sometimes it can be linked to the loss of a privilege for kids who are a little bit older, you know, on around at least five and uh, up to uh, 10 years old. But we try to think, okay, can we, you know, give a consequence that's predictable each time this particular behavior happens and in a safe way? And for those parents who are, are looking, for example, for ways to do a timeout where they feel like it's all failed before because they have younger kids, look to the Kasdan book I recommend in the resources or look to interventions like parent-child interaction therapy, which has really great ways of structuring timeouts so that they can be effective. Uh, privilege lost is part and parcel of almost any uh, behavioral parent training uh, work. Now with teenagers, we really try to figure out with parents um, where they draw the line between kind of normal teenage attitude and something that really impairs family functioning and is uh, both unhealthy for the teenager and unhealthy for the parent. And again, decreasing attitude does not have a single strategy associated with it. All behaviors need a hierarchical stratified approach. So in that sense, if you want to decrease teenage attitude, the focus is first, how do we find more moments to connect with the teenager? in places where we won't have to remind them that they should clean their room or that they need to do their homework or that there are certain things that we have on their task list. And that can be a good process. Uh, at the beginning of therapy, it can take a couple of weeks with parents just to find things that they can offer, offer in a neutral enough way that the teen engages, and then spend some time together re, you know, 
uh, kind of discovering that they can spend time in, in less uh, negative ways. Um, and at the same time, we, we do a lot of ignoring of the attitude in those initial stages in trying to uh, model for the teen how we'd like the interaction to go. And miraculously, many parents will say, even in searching for quality time with their teen and modeling how they'd like to be spoken to, their teen may rediscover a little bit of the polite person they might have uh, been in the past or the polite person that they are uh, with other people some, to some degree. And then the other thing that we go to is with, with moments of really severe attitude, there may be reasons to think about the profile of privileges that teen has and to be saying, if I can't get to you through trying to connect with you, build a relationship and you know, appreciate the good things you're doing, and I still get attitude at this point, uh, that may affect your curfew. It may affect the amount of spending money I'm willing to give you. It may affect my willingness to allow you to get together with your friends. Uh, it may affect my willingness to uh, allow you to make online purchases in the game that you like. All of these things can be linked in contracts to a team. What we focus on with parents, though, especially with attitude, is that you got to be really specific about what that looks like so that the teen can see their path to success. So it isn't just how you feel about their attitude over the course of a long time period, like a week. It's that we try to say, okay, if we can have three conversations where we really keep a calm voice with each other, that can be the link, you know, this first level of privilege, not just the absence of all attitude, which can take some time. Right. Okay. Third, third pain point, which is sure. related. Uh, lying. Yeah. So we're seeing, I'm seeing this across the spectrum from young mm -hmm. to teen um, and parents who are, uh, they don't want to tolerate it. They realize it's a very messy road to go down. Uh, any strategies for that? Right. I mean, lying takes many, many different forms. Whenever anyone tells us their kid is lying, uh, we, we delve into a lot of data gathering. And trying to figure out what this is because there are certain types of lying that are indicative of more severe conduct problems like uh lying in a way that places blame on other people gets revenge uh starts to play you know certain kind of puppeteer with social situations and getting people mad at each other that that's the most kind of severe form of lying uh then there's lying to kind of get out of trouble which is really common for a lot of kids then there's lying based on sincere belief or intent versus performance in the sense that lots of kids will be asked about an English paper and they fully intend on getting that done within two hours, but they don't want to go through the rigmarole of having to tell you their plan. So they just tell you it's done. And then the problem is for a lot of kids with ADHD, they don't end up finishing it. They got distracted, but they intended to finish it. And so in the moment felt it wasn't a lie. And so there's lots of ways that we try to figure out what's the kind of honesty we're trying to engender as the positive opposite. So we may have to punish lying in certain situations when it occurs, like if you're throwing your sister under the bus or if uh, you know, it involves getting out of trouble when in reality there should have been a consequence. That may cause us to say to parents, you may give a consequence for misbehavior, and then you may give an additional consequence for lying about it. There may be kind of a staged way of doing it. But then at the same time, we try to figure out how can we create a space where it's beneficial for the child to practice telling us the truth. Like for example, with parents and uh, substance use uh, amongst teenagers, we say that the difficulty with substance use among teenagers is the best approach is to be sure that they are aware that you are opposed to them utilizing alcohol or substances. You are not in any way in favor of kids using it at certain people's houses or uh, getting together and doing it or all giving their keys into a jar and then drinking together. None of those things have been shown to help in decreasing alcohol or substance use among teens. It's that we want parents to realize telling teens we want you to delay this or not do it as long as possible. It's the best way to protect their developing brain and at the same time uh, protect their safety. But then beyond that, what we say to parents is emphasize open communication and trust. That knowing teenagers, we know they may have moments where they decide to do this against our better advice. And in those moments, if they get into trouble, we want them to know that the punishment will be less if they are honest with us about what happens. In some ways, there's a Good Samaritan policy like what exists in a lot of colleges where they've shown decreases in safety incidents associated with alcohol if there's a, a lower level or no punishment for people reporting you know, unsafe situations. It's those kinds of things where it's a little bit of weird doublespeak for parents, but we're trying to say, okay, we don't want teens to lie, but at the same time, we want to be sure to set boundaries around certain behaviors. So anyway, there's, there's lots to delve into there and, and lots, again, in the resources I listed on the resource slide. Let's go for a last question. 
Yes. Um, and actually that segues perfectly because right. we received a lot of questions from parents who also have ADHD and they're right. looking for next steps, um, yeah. because they realize their own, um, emotional dysregulation in a lot of instances. Um, yeah. they want to work on that so that they can do a better job, um, responding in all the ways you, you described. Right. And, and look, what I'll say about, uh, parents and stress management is that, uh, first of all, if you're a parent, and you're looking for a book on ADHD that even though it's oriented toward kids has helpful strategies for you in managing your ADHD as well. Taking Charge of ADHD, the Russell Barkley book that I recommend in the resources, uh, is, is really fantastic. Beyond that, emotion dysregulation is not a symptom of ADHD. It's merely something that often happens for kids with ADHD because they get really frustrated with the effect of their symptoms. And for parents, frustration is part of parenting just when your kid's not doing something, and can also be even more frustrating if you are battling your own ADHD symptoms while your child is also struggling with them as well. So when we talk about emotion regulation, that's where I was kind of referring earlier to the idea of like uh, kind of gently related cognitive behavioral skills for stress management. Like we recommend a book called Mind Over Mood, where it's a very classic book in psychology, but for adults, it can break down a lot of emotion regulation strategies uh, into you know, uh, kind of digestible ways we can think about how your thoughts, behaviors, and feelings interact with some strategies to decrease your stress. The other thing that I will also throw out there, if you're looking to decrease stress overall, there's kind of this active zone of strategies for parents, which is through, say, cognitive behavioral work, like mind over mood. There's also, of course, a whole other wave of psychology that is focused on acceptance-focused strategies. So the idea that you're not trying to necessarily do anything you're trying to instead be mindfully kind of present and riding the wave of some of the emotions you feel. And in that sense, we've seen many parents who've seen success in decreasing their own emotional dysregulation through mindfulness interventions. And this can take many forms. You can get it from yoga or Pilates, or you can get it from more formal sources, like uh, folks like John Kabat-Zinn, who's been the person in this country who's done a lot to uh, help make mindfulness and meditation interventions really digestible for the general populace and something that you can use for emotional health uh, and wellness. The last thing I'll say for parents, uh, first check is not about whether or not you're using CBT strategies or whether or not you're engaging in a mindfulness practice. It's whether or not you're sleeping, eating, hydrating, and moving your body. Those four things. If you do those four things or focus on any given one of them in any week, Parents get better at parenting, whether or not they're applying other strategies, uh, you know, for, for cognitive behavioral or, or mindfulness focused management of emotional stress. And I'll say again, get some sleep, eat some stuff regularly, hydrate yourself and move your body sometimes. You do those things. It's uh, not necessarily a treatment for any specific mental health and learning disorder, but it helps everybody with their mental health symptoms. I love that advice. And it's a great way to end um, with everyone. Very four things we can all focus exactly. on. <laughs> and um, I tried to frame them incrementally, like not a number of hours of sleep. It's just get a little more or eat a little bit more regularly or that kind of stuff. A little better every day. Exactly. Dr. Anderson, thank you so much. Um, this webinar was incredibly helpful. I think you packed in about 12 topics. So uh, right. I'm trying to go on a Lynn manuel Miranda type like, uh, presentation style here, you know, <laughs> try to pack in as many lyrics as possible. You, you succeeded. You succeeded. Well, um, thank you so much on behalf of all the Attitude team and uh, listeners here today and those joining us later. We appreciate your time and expertise. And I did just want to mention quickly, if you want to know about other future Attitude webinars, uh, articles, research updates, all that good stuff, you can sign up to receive alerts. Just visit Attitude Mag dot com slash newsletters. And uh, with that, I will sign off. Thank you again, Dr. Anderson. And thanks everyone for joining us today.